practices and are definitely prone to error. And actually, medical error is still the sixth leading cause of death in North America. And despite huge advances in imaging technology, labs, and explosion of EM literature, um, the misdiagnosis rate detected through autopsy studies has really not changed that much. Uh, in fact, studies on diagnostic error in uh, emergency medicine have shown uh, error rates up to uh, 12%. And usually, it's not because of a lack of knowledge. Usually, it's a cognitive error or some flaw in the decision-making process. So in my last lecture to you, I make an attempt to delve into how we think to avoid these lectures, hopefully giving you guys some tools and, uh, you know, kind of reflect on it so that you can go forward in your residency careers uh, to really think about how you think. Um, I think this story really does, does start, though, by going all the way back to medical school. And during medical school, we had what we called like a top-down approach, right? From the beginning, you're taught to sit down with the patient, introduce yourself, uh, build rapport, ask these open-ended questions with the idea that you're going to have like 25 minutes to just get the history. And it's always like, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Uh, you do a complete physical exam regardless of their chief complaint. You might dip, uh, create a differential diagnosis and pathologies for every single system, vascular, neuro, uh, infectious, cardiac. You determine the tests you want to confirm your diagnosis as if there's no barrier to obtaining these at all. And then you pat yourself on the back when it confirms your differential diagnosis. And oftentimes, we are valued as physicians and how good we are by the size of our differential diagnosis. And I think one of the biggest transitions when you go from medical school and you become an, an intern is that you make this jump to uh, the patient encounter where you actually turn the process and the thought process on its head. So a good example of this is, you know, a resuscitation. Patient with undifferentiated acute dyspnea, um, you start with your mantra and this will become like ingrained in your head, ABCs, IVO2 monitor. In period treatment, you might just start them on some non-invasive uh, ventilation. You'll order your tests, you'll reassess, and then you might finally stabilize them and get your H&P, your refined testing, and your specific treatment. So what you're really getting at in terms of your thought process is the question of what does the patient need right now? So in your hazard, in, this is, uh, and even when we're not resuscitating uh, people from the dead, when we have the time to take the history, um, you know, you might, use this typical history uh, script using like the OPQRST mnemonic. But what you're really trying to get at is when did you start dying? What provokes you, prevents you from dying? How are you dying? Where are you going to die? Is this going to be an ugly death? And how long have you been dying for? Right? Because what our jobs are really to make sure that they're not dying right now or they're not dying soon-ish, right? And if they're not dying right right now or soon-ish, your job is to still think about what does the patient need right now? And that can be anything from as simple as like peace of mind, a place to sleep, a sandwich, and a work note. And that will get you through a lot of really difficult patient encounters. And honestly, this is the art of what we do. This is where we spend most of our time. So by the end of intern year, you're finally getting the hang of this thought process. Um, and you're getting the hang of actually seeing a patient, but you're quickly reminded that seeing three to six patients in 12 hours is just not gonna cut it. And you got your senior resident down the, down the way, giving you dirty looks, you're, you're attending, whispering into the senior resident's ear, like get this guy to see more patients. And I remember one specific shift uh, where I was getting these weird looks from my senior uh, and my attending, I think it got me into thinking differently about how I was gonna approach the shift. And uh, the shift was actually with Dr. Wiener, and, he, and I don't think it was actually out of one of these pink sheets, but I think of Dr. Wiener whenever I, I see one of these pink sheets. Um, and with the scribble of an emergency physician, uh, he creates his priority list. Resuscitation, stabilization, uh, pain control, discharge, admit, and then all over shit. Um, so obviously I felt that overwhelming sense of poop 
to poop again because I was overwhelmed. But instead of running to the bathroom for some positive affirmations, I discharged and admitted those patients ASAP. And you know, this is a really big growing point for me in terms of uh, you know, as you make that transition to first from first year to second year, uh, it's no longer just about you and the patient. You really have to think about in the entire room. Um, and, you know, I, I really like this list a lot, but um, when I really think about how this list has changed for me over the, the past couple of years, I'm actually going to expand on it slightly. Um, and I think this is what, these are all the things that we think about and makes us, uh, which is what separates us from everybody else in the hospital. And many of them overlap, but it's resuscitation, identification of a dangerous conditions, symptom relief, determination of disposition slash level of care, managing ED flow, customer service, whether you like it or not, resource stewardship and public health, and encompassing all of this is education. Right, so now you kind of built this framework of like, all right, now I'm an emergency physician, I know how to think through a patient, and know how to think through my priorities. Um, so let's change gears a little bit. And I think the next uh, section of this talk, uh, you know, this, I really like this quote because it, I think it really does kind of encompass like what we have, what we do in emergency medicine, that life is short and the art long, the occasion instant, experiment perilous, and decision difficult. And that last part really resonates with me because this is where I think I made probably the most growth in my, in terms of uh, becoming an physi uh, emergency physician. So I'm gonna, uh, so over the last two years, I'll, and for the remainder of this talk, I'm uh, mostly gonna talk about decision-making. So let's start with a patient, 65-year-old male, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, acute onset of chest pain and shortness of breath. Quick, what is this? Anybody? Nobody? Am I? All right, am I? Yeah, let's call it am I, right? And then the decision that you have is troponin, no troponin. But, you know, you, what did you use here? You kind of just use your intuition, right? So the, the course of our day depends on decisions like this, right? Fast, efficient, thoughtful. Um, so I think what you do in order to make that next step from like just seeing the patient to thinking about the room is that you kind of have to grow into uh, how do I do this more efficiently and think through these patients more effectively, right? So the, you really have to think, right? uh, So no, no uh, presentation on decision-making is complete without going over type one and type two thinking and this dual process of thinking. So I'll go over it briefly and I think a lot of people already know what it is, but put simply, Type one thinking is that intuitive pattern recognition fast, but it's often prone to error. And then you have this type two thinking, which is more critical, logical, carefully calculated, slow, but in, we're thought of to be like precise. But why do we have to be careful with type one? And honestly, this is type one is probably what you're using like 90% of the time. And we just have to be aware of our biases and bias it, and type one is especially uh, prone to, to bias. Um, and it's the biases that, uh, as I explained before, lead to a lot of the medical error. It's not the lack of knowledge, which is kind of a relief to me because the breadth of emergency medicine and the amount of things you have to, knew, to know is, is you're never going to be able to, to figure it all out. But at least you could really use your resources to really think about the process. So I think a lot of people already know what cognitive biases are right? It's like biases of uh, how a patient looks, how you're feeling in the moment. There's recency bias. There's the confirmation bias, like you want the positive answer. So you're going to more likely think that that's the right answer. And you might be uh, tempted to think that these biases don't um, affect you, but they really do. But it's no knock on your intelligence. Rationality and intelligence are separate, right? Uh, so just like intelligence won't allow you to solve like advanced uh, mathematical algorithms without training in mathematics, can't really master rationality, which is what I'm gonna be talking about without studying its process and its known errors. So let's get into this, right? You take these two facial expressions. Immediately, if you saw these patients, you would bring certain 
feelings and thoughts, right? So the left patient is angry and it's probably gonna be an unpleasant uh, patient interaction. And the right is a pleasant looking, uh, well-appearing lady and it's probably gonna be easy patient interaction. And I think like our biases will inform our pattern recognition and we have to be able to recognize that uh, that this will affect our decision with both of these patients, right? Because maybe the patient on the right is getting ready to sun down any second to you right now and make your overnight a living hell, but here we are, so. And it's interesting because this has actually been studied. Uh, Jeff Klein is like a guy that I've read multiple times because um, I've developed some obsession over PE, but he does a lot of the, uh, he published two studies on uh, just the way people look. And one of these is like uh, titled Decreased Facial Expression in Those with Serious Cardio Cardiopulmonary Disease. Um, and I remember Silverberg saying that this is like kind of your game in the pod, right? You got to find the needle in the haystack because there's that one patient that's dying somewhere uh, and you got to find that patient. And uh, there was actually, this actually happened at Lutheran for me and it was a busy day and there is this uh, elderly Chinese male that was just sitting in his bed being really obedient and just uh, just being super patient. I kept on saying, I'll be right back, I'll be right back. And then, you know, um, my attending had shot on some labs and got everything done and this guy was having an MI. So like he was actively dying in front of me, but I was cognitively unloading him because he just looked like he was being obedient and stoked. And you just gotta be really careful about this. Um, the other thing too that's interesting is that Klein also looked at a uh, smiling patient and its effect on the, uh, the probability of PE. And in this one, it didn't really affect the eventual outcomes for these patients, but smiling patients on average lowered the uh, physician's uh, pretest probability for PE. So, you know, let's go back to this patient. Same patient, 65, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. A lot of you uh, thought MI didn't have to order the troponin. But, you know, what if I told you that this was a patient that presented on March 29, 2020, and the diagnosis was COVID, right? So this is like, this is, a, this is where we fail with type 1 thinking. And um, I think developing your instincts is, is a huge part of residency and it's just important to continue to be skeptical. Um, I think we should also be really mindful of you know external factors too. Um, there was this particular paper which shows that there is actually a rise in admission rates from 35 percent to 40 percent when shifting from an empty waiting room with like zero patient load to a full waiting room and like a 16 patient load. So you know with that said, there's many decisions that we have to make in our head with many factors like how the patient looks, how the department looks, and even the community working. So I think there's like some tools that I've tried to use to, over the years uh, to help me cognitively unload and try to make these decisions better. One of which is uh, clinical decision tools. Um, and I, I thought by, especially in that transition from second year to third year that I could create more brain space by unloading my decisions onto MD calc, right? Like you get the Wells criteria or the PERC criteria, you score zero on both, it's not a PE. In fact, um, you know, there's, I think there's a few things to note about this though. Um, one, I think it gives you a false sense of security. Uh, and it forced me into a more algorithmic type of medicine where I was taking patients and putting them into a computer and it was spinning me out, spinning out, um, a result. And I actually did this for a while and I was able to see more patients and maybe did it more efficiently, but this like burned me out like crazy. And I don't think I realized it until I, I stopped doing this. And I thought about the patients more. I read the actual literature behind it that I actually progressed in my career uh, as, a, as a resident and really uh, started to enjoy the work again. Um, and as I have this conversation with Dr. Schechter and we say it all the time, that rarely should a clinical decision tool change your, uh, change your mind. If anything, use it as a check to help keep your biases in check, right? Because remember, you come into, every clinical decision tool requires a pretest probability that you calculate in your head. You put this into 
MD calc for any kind of score. You have to come to set, use Bayesian theory and don't get me into that. I won't get into it right now. And then you come with a post-test probability. And oftentimes you're using it primarily to, uh, to check yourself, right? Um, and I think a lot of studies generally agree. I don't think necessarily one is better than the other, but experience doesn't really trump a lot of these uh, clinical decision tools. Uh, in general, a lot of these papers that talk about the heart score and the well score um, really say that decision gestalt is about the same as clinical decision tools. The tools might be a little bit um, more efficient, but in general, it's not really a replacement for physician experience, physician thought process. And then another tool that we use, and a lot of these tools are based off is EBM. And uh, evidence-based medicine being like the conscientious, explicit, judicious, and reasonable use of the modern best evidence in making decisions about uh, the care of individual patients. So when I was a junior resident, even going into third year, I thought I was gonna be hot shit and read a bunch of abstracts and a bunch of MRAP and then say, oh, I just read this thing where, you know, this is going on. Um, but instead of being hot shit, I was actually full of shit. Uh, because like we, evidence-based medicine is uh, only one component uh, of a larger thought process, right? So, you know, there's all, I've also been this guy where, who says EBM six dangerous words. Um, and in JAMA, there's an excellent commentary on uh, EBM six dangerous words. And that being, there's no evidence to suggest as if I did a complete lit review and really found that there was no evidence to suggest. But this is meant to be something that's uh, precise, but it ended up being a blanket statement for a couple of statements. Uh, one of which is risk, is risk exceeds benefits for some patients, but not for others, which doesn't mean that it doesn't work. There's no proven benefit, which doesn't mean that it doesn't work either. And then the scientific evidence is inconclusive or insufficient. And I think there's no evidence that suggests implies negativity. Uh, and we use it to mean negativity with precision when the real thing that we should say is that um, we and the rest of the medical community don't really know and that's totally okay, right? Um, there's another fascinating commentary uh, from the BMG titled, Does Evidence-Based Medicine Adversely uh, Affect Clinical Judgment? And these two physicians actually go back and forth. Uh, and Dr. Akkad um, actually uh, argues that the EBM movement um, arose primarily from a desire to standardize care and not individually individualize it. And his point was that you're taking the average effects under average circumstances with a lot of average docs and you're applying it to this entire population. Um, and people really like that, right? Because they have protocols, they have guidelines, they have things that they're sure about. And this is really good because large hospital systems can uh, institute um, guidelines uh, it's good for insurance companies because they can now put a price on something for doing the right thing. Um, and it introduces a bias of treating individuals as a population. And I know Dr. Sinnott's going to love this, but perfect example of this is the sepsis protocols, right? Thanks a lot, Manny Rivers. Uh, and it's really taking a thought out of what we do as physicians. And I think that's what's frustrating about it. You're, individual, you're taking... Uh, early goal-directed therapy and then applying it to our population. So you don't even have to think. The patient might be septic before you even see it based off your flag and epic, right? So you freak out, you call your sepsis code, and then you order your sepsis bundle. And of course, you're done ordering your 30 cc per kg bolus. And it's crazy because in many ways in our current system, we're rewarded or even mandated to follow this process and we this was a way of cognitively unloading this process but at what cost right so you know this is like one of these things where we've kind of given up given up uh, uh, our autonomy into this like EBM machine uh, I think we're smart our goal is to actually be smart enough and smarter than the protocols to 
um, you know, these were to be better doctors, right? These guidelines are made for doctors that don't think. So don't be a drill and just be smart. On the other hand, I'm not completely knocking the use of evidence-based medicine. Um, I think appropriately, uh, the, the counter argument was that evidence-based medicine does uh, keep our overconfidence in check, which is important to recognize as a bias when you're thinking through things. We do definitely live in our own little bubble of beliefs. Um, and you know, the, the main takeaway from how you could use evidence-based medicine is to really believe that the randomized controlled trials are there to uh, provide you with a starting point for developing knowledge base. Um, but it's really uh, the experience that you add on to that and the patient in front of you that, uh, you, you, that allows you to effectively use evidence-based medicine. And it's even in the original contract of evidence-based medicine that it includes three things, right? It includes the best research available. And just because the research says that it's good, doesn't mean it's necessarily good in your experience or for the patient's values, right? Great example of this is Donald Trump. He's taking hydroxychloroquine. We're very quick to say there's no evidence to suggest that hydroxychloroquine used as prophylaxis is effective in preventing COVID-19. But there isn't any evidence and there's insufficient evidence. And I'm biased against this dude because I don't like this guy, right? So I think he's stupid. But this is probably in line with his values. And he got some doctor that has clinical expertise in quotes um, that thinks that this could be a potential effective treatment. So there's a lot of ways to use evidence-based medicine, and this is one of those ways. An even simpler one is, you know, your kid falls off a bike, has a cut, you say you're gonna kiss it and make it all better, but who am I to judge as a doctor thinking through this process uh, that, you know, kissing it is not gonna be any better than placebo. But we're, you know, we're doctors and you know, it's our, our job to really think about all these three components uh, to put EBM together. So why does this matter? Um, I think it's because we are part, uh, we're a part of a profession that's uh, in an unprecedented time when the prof profession actually demands much more than us than ever before, right? We're actually in this era of like too much information, um, but on the bright side of that, a lot of that information is like right at our fingertips um, and where we can provide our values when there's no protocol, no obvious evidence, and there's a lot of gray areas, right? I mean, like even look at the research now and you recertify for your boards, it's open book now, right? So it's about using your thought process and using, uh, using your resources uh, to kind of move yourself forward, right? Because, um, this is the kind of stuff that separates us from a lot of things, you know, one of which is uh, like, for example, a supercomputer and artificial intelligence. Like right before medical school, I actually worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, and I worked in their analytics department. And my job was to actually sift through uh, tons and tons of papers without actually reading them. I would just look at the results of these papers for say like therapeutics for colon cancer. I would take all the data, I would dump them into like a bunch of data fields for uh, that was on the Watson. And some doctor would uh, download that data, put a bunch of patient data in it, and all of a sudden it would package this customized like cancer treatment. And there was no th thought really put into it other than having a supercomputer. So what is gonna make us better than a supercomputer? Super I know that I'm not gonna be able to read all these papers. Um, so this is where it becomes important to actually think about what the patient values are. Um, and this is where you being at the bedside makes uh, most of the difference. And honestly, this has been highlighted, especially now that we're disposable. We are not, we don't have the job security that we thought we had when this all first started, right? And this is especially highlighted during COVID when like visits are at unprecedentedly low levels your career is threatened and the only way you can really prove your worth is by showing how you think. Um, and there's nothing wrong with these professions. 
In fact, I think we should be embracing them because we should be we should ele we should be thank them for pushing us this much uh, because they are not our replacements. They are simply reminders that we have to elevate our practice of emergency medicine. And most of all, like it's because these people deserve your critical thinking, right? And COVID was a great example of that. When there's no evidence, when there's no protocols, when there's no guidelines, doctors are their only hope because you know, it's not that black and white. So it gets me into this. What is the purpose of residency? And it, this feels a lot like what's the purpose of life, but um, you know, if you ever read this book, Blink, um, I think one of the reasons people really gravitate to this book and why it was so popular was it presents this idea that we magically know things without actually knowing why we know these, these things, right? This gut feeling and this intuition. And Malcolm Gladwell often make the argument that uh, sometimes, and often actually a majority of the time, these uh, decisions are much better uh, than actually the type two thinking. But even, even he has to admit that, um, and this is a quote from Blink uh, specifically, is that the ability to make these rapid, thin slice Blink decisions comes only after years of training, experience, and painstaking, painstaking statistical sifting and computer analysis of reams of evidence, enough to permit the deliberate construction of a sophisticated model of the phenomenon about which decisions must be made. Uh, it's a long way of saying more patients, more learning, right? Um, but I'm gonna extend that again a little bit. And um, the value of experience is not necessarily always just in seeing much, but is in seeing wisely. So I implore you as like junior residents and even as you go further, you really need to uh, give yourself immediate feedback on your type one thinking and your heuristics. So that includes following up on your patients, questioning your consultants, watching your interventions actually work in real time. I can tell you how many times I've told an intern uh, during an APE case to stand at the bedside and actually see what happens when you start that positive pressure and ventilation and you give the nitroglycerin because you, you really need to see that effect happen. Um, and your gut and intuition come from an immediate feedback of our jobs. Uh, so validate your heuristics and spend, you know, whatever time you have left in residency doing that. Um, there's another fantastic paper that I have to credit D'Souza for sharing with me and it's called uh, the master clinician's approach to diagnostic reasoning. Uh, and it says learners should appreciate that information is not the same as understanding and understanding is not the same as insightful experience, which is the basis of clinical wisdom. I mean, if you think about it, the edge that the faculty has all, over all of us is their experience and that much amount of time at the bedside that you don't have. So push them to share it with you, right? Like demand it and be relentless about it to get that experience and so that you can refine your thinking. So um, that kind of like gets me to my parting words, right? Uh, as an emergency physician, we think differently, right? That top down versus that bottom up uh, approach that we talked about. You're not just responsible for your patient, you're responsible for the department and your community. And that's especially true in our like under-resourced, overrun uh, hospitals. Understand the tools that you have to make a decision, um, but also understand the limits of them. Um, and be skeptical and curious. You should always keep yourself in check, whether it's making too easy decisions, being overconfident, right? More patience, more learning as well, but be wise about it. And I didn't really include this, but of course be nice, right, Dr. G? Um, so uh, many thanks to everybody that like just, I didn't really bounce too many of these ideas off of people, but there are some. Um, most, most of the time people are just hearing me complain about the fact that I had to put this together. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, the, no senior lecture would be uh, complete until I uh, thanked a, a couple people, right? So our leadership, Dr. Lucchese, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Zaki, Dr. Holt, Dr. Lino, Dr. Verma, our program leadership, Dr. Smith, Willis, Kendall, Hassel, Dr. Schrecker, Gennaro, Regan, Acasio at some point. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of people that really did push me how to think, like Dr. D'Souza, Dr. Barron, Dr. Sinner, Dr. Grincharmer, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim, 
Dr. Stetz, Dr. Wolfram, Dr. Tajani, I'm sure I'm missing a couple more, right? And then I have these two guys from the class of 2001. On the left is my cousin, actually, that actually graduated with Silverberg. Uh, and I never thought I'd be looking up to these two guys, of all people, but here we are. Um, and of course, my, uh, uh, my co-residents, some of the most incredible people I've ever met. Uh, you guys uh, really pushed me and allowed me to be a leader and an educator and made me a better doctor. Um, and then my fourth year class, uh, kind of a dis this, uh, dysfunctional family, but here we are finally at the end and what an incredible ride. Um, my co-chiefs, who probably taught me more about le leadership than I could ever imagine, as well as, but they mostly function as my sounding board when I was ready to lose it for most of the year. Uh, my family, that's my dad on the left, my sister on the right, who's actually also a nurse. Uh, she's like a hospice nurse uh, with all the nursing home patients that uh, have COVID. Um, and of course, my incredible wife has been at my side this entire time. Uh, she's like, she's actually my biggest fan. Uh, I couldn't be able to get through this without her. I think she's actually on the Zoom watching this because she was so excited to, one, finally stop hearing me talk about my stupid senior lecture, and two, so I could actually create the brain space to like do things around the house. Um, so as many of you know, I, like my journey into medicine started when my mom passed away like 12 years ago. And as devastating as it was, it, I think it was her way of like, letting me run free and find my calling. Uh, and so I dedicate this lecture and my life's work in medicine to her today and every day. So this place is like really special to me because Kings County and Downstate uh, really gave me that opportunity to honor her and it, it truly brought me back to life. Um, and although that tragedy just seems like yesterday, it seems appropriate that as I finally complete the training stage of uh, my life, the story closes with not only my completion of residency, but also a new life that is yet to come any day today. Well, not today, any day soon. <laughs> Right. like within the next two weeks. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys.